In this video, I'm going to take a look at an example using the conjugate beam method to find the deflections both at two points in a beam and also at the entire beam along its length. Uh, the problem that I'm going to do is the exact same problem that I did for the moment area theorem example in a previous video. So we should be able to see that we'll get the exact same answers. So if you recall, here's the uh, the problem that we did for the moment area theorem example. We have a propped cantilever beam with a hinge in the middle making this a determinate structure. We have a 37 kilonewton per meter uniform load between A and B, a 155 kilonewton point load at the very end kind of of the diving board and then uh, 5 meter 2.5 two, and 2.5 and the uh, beam between A and B is a little bit stockier than it is between B and D. So we have 4 over, thre four over 3 times I here and I here for the second moment of area. And so we're asked to find the slopes and deflections at points B and D, which is exactly what we were asked to do at the moment area. And we uh, have a constant E along the section. And in that previous video, we already determined what the curvature diagram is for this beam and it looks like this. So we have a parabola. This is a parabola between A and B with a peak that occurs at this is 0 0.811 meters from A and then we have a triangle here. So this is negative curvature which means that the beam is bending down and this part is positive curvature, curvature which means that the beam is bending up. So up like this and down like this. Okay, so for the conjugate beam method, the idea is that uh, we take advantage of some of the symmetries that exist between the relationships between load, shear, and moment, and the relationships between uh, curvature, slope, and deflection. So the idea is that we create a conjugate beam where we treat the curvatures as if they're loads, we treat the slopes as if they were shears, and we treat the deflections as if they were moments. And in order to create that conjugate beam uh, where we can apply those curvatures as loads, we have to also change the reactions. And so we have to pick reactions so that, okay, at A, for example, we have zero slope and we have zero deflection because of this fixed end. So we have to put a reaction in our conjugate beam that has zero shear and zero moment. And that would be a free end. So at a free end, we know there's zero shear and zero moment. At B, where we have a hinge, we have a situation in our beam where we have, in our real beam, where we have a, uh, a non-zero slope, but that slope can be discontinuous at that hinge location because this can bend down and have one slope on this side and another slope on the other side uh, because we have a moment release. Uh, and we also have a non-zero deflection because this can move down, but that deflection is continuous. So uh, the deflection at B is the same on the left side as it is on the right side. So the situation, we need to find a situation that is the same except in terms of shears and moments instead of slopes and deflections. So if we put a roller here, then that roller creates a reaction which causes a discontinuity in the shear, uh, just like there is a non the discontinuity in the slope here. So the slope is different on the left side as the right side. So if we have a reaction, then the shear is different on the left side than it is on the right side. Uh, but the deflection The deflection here is non-zero but continuous, therefore the moment for this situation has to be non-zero and continuous. So we can have a non-zero moment here since this, uh, this beam is continuous and that moment is also continuous, meaning that it doesn't have a jump in it. So the shear is going to have a jump due to this reaction and the moment's not. So that makes it the same as the hinge. Now what if we have this situation here? We have uh, not a zero deflection because this roller here maintains the deflection at zero, uh, but we have a non-zero slope. So zero deflection, non-zero slope, but that slope has to be the same on the left as on the right since this is a continuous beam. 
So that means that our shear has to be the same on the left as on the right. Okay, so we know that we can't have some sort of break here, but the uh, the moment has to be zero. So in order to make a zero moment here, we have a hinge. And so the moment is always zero, but the shear is not. Shear can transfer through this hinge, but the shear is continuous. There's no jump because there's no reaction. Now the last part here, which is the free end, D, at D, we can have some sort of non-zero slope and some sort of non-zero deflection. So this can basically deform any way that it likes. So that means that in our conjugate beam, we have to have a non-zero shear and a non-zero moment. And the way that we can do that is by adding a fixed end, which adds a non-zero shear reaction, okay, which puts a shear at the end of this beam, and a non-zero moment reaction which creates a non-zero moment at the end of this beam. So this is B and this is D. Now that we have our conjugate beam, we apply our curvatures to that beam as if they were forces. So an upwards curvature in the way that we've defined it. Okay, so a curvature that's drawn on the compression side of the beam creates an upwards load on the beam. So I'm gonna draw it on the bottom here. Okay, where we have a maximum like this this value is the same, 234.4 over EI, and this value here is 243.5 over EI. And this is a distributed load in the shape of a parabola where all the load is pushing up. Then the second part here <clears throat> this triangular load, since it's on the bottom of the curvature diagram, this is a downwards bending part of the beam, then the loads have to push down. And they're going to have a triangular shape that looks like this. Okay, and those push down on the beam. So in the class that I did on this, I drew everything on the top and I just had these pulling up and these pushing down and it was a little bit confusing so now I've, I've always put these loads pushing against the beam either pushing it up or pushing it down and hopefully you can see better that this is directly related to the curvature diagram it is the curvature diagram and this is 387.5 over EI so this is a hinge and we recall that this is This is 0 0.811, this is 4.189 meters, this is 2.5 meters, and this is 2.5 meters. Okay, so that's our conjugate beam system. So the nice thing about the conjugate beam method compared to the moment area method is that now that we have this conjugate beam and we have our loads, all we have to do is solve for the so-called shears, which are actually our slopes, and the so-called moments of this beam, which are actually our deflections. And so we do that in the exact same way that we always find uh, moments and shears. Um, so that means we don't have to worry about finding reference tangent and relating different deflections to that reference tangent in order to find the deflections that we want. It also means that if we can find a moment diagram for this beam, then we have basically come up with deflected shape. And that's usually a little easier said than done because for these kind of conjugate beams, uh, since we're using the curvature diagrams, they often tend to have um, uh, linearly varying uh, distributed loads or parab parabolically linear, uh, varying distributed loads, which makes finding the shear and moment diagrams a little bit of a challenge. But first thing we want to do is just find the deflections and the slopes at point B and D, which we can do using an equilibrium type of method. Okay, so first step is to find our reactions. And so I'm going to just draw section AC uh, in isolation so that we can use that to find our first reaction. So we're used to finding the areas of rectangles, 
rectangular shaped loads and of triangular shaped loads generally, but maybe we're not so familiar with doing it for parabola, so I'm going to do it a little bit explicitly here. Uh, if we have this parabola, okay, we're going to first solve the sum of m, uh, sum of moments about c, and this is going to allow us to find by, since we know all of these other points here. I forgot one here. This is 387.5 over EI. Okay, so if I want to find the sum of the moments about B, I need the centroids of all of these shapes. So for the triangle, it's right here. Okay, that's one-third of this distance. So the total distance was 2.5. So it's one-third 2.5, which is equal to 0 0.833. Okay, and then for the parabolas here, we're going to have to kind of split them up. So the parabolas always have to have one zero slope part uh, in order to find the uh, area quite easily. So here we know we have a zero slope here where the parabola changes. Um, and so if we know this area very easily. Uh, we need to know this distance here. So for a parabola, the centroid is 5 eighths from the long side, sorry, from 5 eighths from the short side. So this is 5 eighths of 4.189, which is this total length here. So that equals 2.618. So it's 5 eighths from the zero side and 3 eighths from the zero slope part here. So now this part, we can't treat this all as a parabola. This is like a parabola trapezoid kind of. So what we do is we can split this here and take this parabola, which has a centroid like this, which is 3 eighths of 0 0.811, which equals 0 0.304. And then this is just a square, or a rectangle, sorry. So we know that that one's halfway in between, which is 0 0.406. Also, it's helpful to know the height of this little tiny parabola here, which is just 243.5 minus 234.4, which is 9.1 over EI. So using this information, I can find the areas of these parabolas. Area of a parabola is just 2 thirds base times height. So that's very easy. So we know the bases, we know the heights, so we know the areas, and we also know the locations of all these centroids. So now I can go ahead and do my sum of moments about C, assuming counterclockwise is positive, and through the magic of television I come out with this. So I've used, I've done all of the moment pieces here from uh, this one's rectangle, parabola, parabola, our unknown reaction, and then the triangle on the right. And then uh, sometimes I find it helpful to do each of these individually to minimize calculation errors. Then so if I solve for by, I get negative 1784.9 over EI. And it's since it's negative and we drew it up, that means that it's in the downwards direction. OK, so now I can do the same thing, sum of Fy up as positive equals zero to find CY. So these are just areas this time instead of areas times moment arms. So this is area times moment arm, area times moment arm. Those moment arms calculated using these centroids. And then so if I solve this for CY, CY I get 13 94.2 over EI, and that's in the plus direction. Okay, so then using that, using that CY, I can find reaction at point D. So this time I'm just going to draw section CD. Now I could just draw the whole free body diagram, and that would make it easy enough for me to find the reactions at D, which are the reactions at the uh, very right side here. But then I would have to do these moments again for every single piece that I've previously done, which 
as you can see from this process, is a little bit involved and kind of error prone. So instead, I'm just going to use section CD. So I'll draw that. So calculating the CY was a pretty relatively easy process because it was just multiplying and adding all the areas together. So here we got CY up. So that's at that hinge. We know that CY is pushing up onto the left side of the beam. That means, as you recall, that if we have a hinge and we make a cut, then the forces have to be equal and opposite on either side of the cut. So since it, CY was up on section AC, it has to be down on section CD. So that's what I've drawn here. Here's the rest of that triangular uh, distribution, triangular curvature that we're applying here. And now we have three components. Now, I didn't bother finding CX before because it was, gonna, it was just equal to zero. Same thing here, DX is going to be equal to zero. So I won't bother going through it. Um, but now that we have this distribution, we can use sum of moments about D equals zero to find first MD. So I do that process. This one is for the triangular distributed load or curvature. So that's just two thirds of the distance for the centroid. And then this is all of the rest of the loads from the left side of the beam bundled up at C point C here and equals zero. So if we solve this for MD, we get negative 4293.0 over EI. Now a little point about this negative. Okay, I've drawn this MD in the first place counterclockwise on the right side of a section. So this is a positive moment effect. Because you'll recall we've defined positive moments like this, where we have bending down and the curvature points up. So this is in a positive sense. If I drew it on the left side of a beam, then this would be a positive moment. So clockwise would be positive. So the benefit of doing it this way is that positive moments uh, that we get out are equivalent uh, in the slopes and deflections to a positive deflection. So positive moment, positive deflection, negative moment, negative deflection with slopes. Positive slope is a counterclockwise slope and a negative slope is a clockwise slope. And that's for positive shear is defined as when the left side is, is up, right? Positive shear. So these are just using these kind of uh, unit uh, positive senses uh, it just makes the map a little bit easier when we come out we know whether we're looking at something that's going up or going down. So this is negative 4293.0 so it's in the opposite direction to which we've drawn it which is clockwise which would create a negative moment effect on the right side of a beam. Okay and then we can use sum of Fy equals zero to find dy. So from this equilibrium, we get dy is 1878.6 over ei, which is positive. So it happens to be pushing us up. So now we know our reactions. Fantastic. So now we want to find the slope and deflection at point B. where it says deflection at point B. Okay, so in order to find the slope and deflection at point B, what we want to do, now that we know our reactions, is we just take a cut. So if we wanted to find the shear or the moment in a beam at a different section, we could just take a cut and split it up, look at all the loads on the left side, and equate them to the transmitted internal forces that would be on the right side of that section. So if we cut a beam here, we'll have a shear in that beam, we'll have a moment, and we'll have an axial force. So we can solve for those directly without necessarily having to solve the full shear or moment diagram. So similarly, for this case, now that we're talking about curvatures, the shear diagram is, the shear is effectively our slope. 
and the moment is effectively our deflection. So if we take a cut here and we find the shear and the moment, the effective kind of shear and moment at that section using the curvatures as loads, then those shears and moments that we come up with are actually our slope and deflection at that point. So I'm gonna draw the section at a cut in B. So here we have our section cut. Now one thing that we have to be careful about is that since there's actually a reaction load at B, the shear is gonna be discontinuous. We're gonna have one shear on one side of B and then the reaction is going to change the shear and the shear will be different on the other side of B. So we have to do two separate cases, one where we include that reaction and one where we don't. So this is the situation where we don't include the reaction, so we're cutting just to the left of B. So B is like over here. Okay, and we use sum of Fy to solve for VB left. Now VB left, again, is drawn in the sense of a positive shear. So a shear down on the right side of a beam is a positive shear because up on the left is positive. And the moment is also drawn in the positive sense for a positive moment in the beam. Now, if you had kept track of these areas when we were doing them before, we did this situation, then that would probably make this situation a little bit easier. But here I am calculating them again from scratch. So if I solve for VB left, I get 875.0 over EI. And from that, I can go straight to calculating our rotation at B on the left side. And that is 875.0. This is in kilonewton meters squared. Okay, so we started with curvature, and then to get the slope, we had to integrate with respect to the deformation. So we got an extra meter here and then I'm going to change that to Newton millimeters squared by adding a 10 to the 9. Newton millimeters squared. Okay, and this is over 205,000 MPA and 1260 times 10 to the 6 millimeters to the 4th. Okay, so now everything is in newtons and millimeters because MPA is newtons per millimeter squared. And then I get that theta B left is equal to 0 0.00339 rads. And that's a positive number. So that means our rotation is like this. And this is the same answer that we got using moment area. So then I have to do the same thing for VB right. And so the only difference here, we have the same situation except now I've included this reaction force which pulls down 1784.9 at B. This is B, this is A. And then I do the sum of uh, vertical forces and this is the answer I got before and now I've just added this extra one, solve again for VB, and I get negative 909.9 in the upwards direction, okay? But this is a negative shear because downward shear on the right side of a beam is positive, according to our sign convention, so an upward shear there is negative. So if this is a negative shear, and I find my, so this is VB right, and I find my slope B right, negative 909 times 9 to the power of 10 to the 9 again 5 and I get theta b right is equal to negative 0 0.00352 rads and so negative is down like this Okay, and this is also the same answer that we got from our moment area theorem. And it makes sense that we have a different slope on the left and on the right because we have a hinge here. And that hinge means that the, the beam is discontinuous for moment in this region. Or it's, sorry, the beam itself is discontinuous. So we can have a kink in that beam, which means we have a different slope on one side than we have on the other.
So if we want to find our moment, we can use either of the above if we take a moment about B, okay, because this reaction is not going to come into play. So moment is the same on either side. So then if I solve for this equation, now again, it would probably make sense if you kept track of these areas as you went so that you didn't have to recalculate them again and then add these moment arms to the centroids of the parabolas. And you get MB is positive 2675.9. And this is positive because, it, and it's in the direction that we've drawn it, which is equivalent to a mo positive moment effect on the beam itself. And so now if I wanna find YB, now, since we've integrated one more time, we've got another m. We've got another uh, linear length dimension multiplied here. So it's kilonewton meter cubed now. And we have 2675.9. So then to get that to kilonewton, sorry, newton millimeters cubed, we have to multiply that by 10 to the 12. So there's 1,000 for kilonewtons, and then 3,000 three times to get to millimeters over 205 the same thing and we get that YB is 10.36 millimeters and it's up because it's a positive moment so we get an upwards deflection so now our last step is to find slope and deflection at point D. Now we already solved already we already solved for the shear and moment at D in the conjugate beam because those were our reaction forces at the end of the beam so you'll recall we found our reactions oh there's C Y yeah so we found MD and we found DY right so recall DY was equal to 1876 sorry 78.6 over EI and that was up and the MD was equal to negative 4293.0 over EI which was in a clockwise direction. Now we know the absolute directions that these point in. Okay, so let's determine which, whether they're positive or negative actually in terms of slope and deflection. So it's on the right side of the beam. This pushes up. Okay, so this is a negative shear. Shear effect. Remember positive is up on the left, down on the right. Okay, so this is up on the right, so it's negative. And then this one is clockwise on the right side, which means that we're going to be bending it up like this, which is negative bending, so this is a negative moment effect. So we know that at D, we're going to have a negative slope, and we're going to have a negative deflection. Okay, so our slope then is equal to negative 1878.6. So it's times 10 to the 9. And we get that theta d is negative 0 0.00727 radians, which is what we got for the moment area theorem, and it's negative, so it turns clockwise from zero. And then yd, negative 4293.0, it's kilonewtons meters cubed, so we'll multiply that by 10 to the 12, 205, 1260, and we get that yd is equal to 16.62 millimeters down. And so now we found the slope at both uh, both sides of B, the deflection of B, and the slope and deflection at D, which is everything that we were asked for. 
Now I'll leave it up to you to judge for yourself whether moment area was easier or this was easier. Here we had to deal with a lot of parabolas, but we got to do it in our regular shear and moment way. Whereas with the moment area theorem, we had simpler areas and moments to calculate, but we also had to think about our reference tangents. So there's plus and minus either way. Probably it takes the same amount of work one way or the other. Um, but conceptually, they're a little bit different, but you always arrive at the same answer. So I'm probably gonna do a follow-up video to this one that uh, finds the full slope and deflection diagrams so that you can see how it's done uh, by finding all the areas of the parabolas and stuff like that. So look for that.